Hello, this is the Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Buck Malik, doing an interview today of Patty Mueller of Tropical Wings. We'll learn about Tropical Wings next. Patty Mueller is a Hudson resident, and she is currently the president of the corporation called Tropical Wings Incorporated. Why don't you tell us what is the focus of Tropical Wings, Patty? I'd be happy to, Buck. Tropical Wings. Um, is all about protecting birds, specifically neotropical migratory birds that are sharing their home um, not only up here but also down in Costa Rica. We actually were created, Tropical Wings was, to support the sister parks relationship, which I'd be happy to tell you more about. Would you? Well, let's make sure that we understand what a neotropical migratory bird is. Say that again, please. Sure. So neotropical migratory birds are birds that spend their summer nesting breeding time, so we're coming upon that now, spend it up here in North America. Uh, and then their winters are gonna spend either in Mexico, Central America, South America, uh, or the Caribbean. So they basically cross the equator. And they, uh, are there actually longer than they're up here, but they don't do any breeding down there. They come up here to breed because there's more resources up here for them hmm. raising their young. Thank you for that. Um, why don't you tell us something about Tropical Wings? Share some information about the organization. Sure, so Tropical Wings um, has been around since about 2011, so we're relatively new. And we had our, our roots, our start, um, as a kind of a group of citizens that were interested in helping support an initiative that the National Park Service was up to. So back in 2010, Chris Stein, who was then superintendent of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, our national park uh, in our backyard here, um, he had the idea of forming a sister park relationship with some other national park. Um, he had his eye on um, Latin America, I think even specifically Costa Rica. And in consultation with colleagues, uh, they came up with the idea that instead of finding a park in Costa Rica that connected based on some geography, like they had a river, they thought that perhaps they should have an arrangement, an agreement, a sister park agreement, with parks that shared a resource. And so the resource that was determined to be a great resource to share is the neotropical migratory birds. And so I think we're one of very few sister park agreements that is around a resource instead of around some shared geography. Hmm, and so remarkable. it's really cool. And so Chris worked very hard and uh, had this great vision and ended up putting together an agreement that had 15 national parks in the upper Midwest connected to seven national parks down in Costa Rica and specifically on the Osa Peninsula of Costa Rica. Um, and a little fun fact about the Osa Peninsula is that they hold their tiny, tiny, tiny little part of Costa Rica, very small landmass, but they hold 2.5% of the world's biodiversity. Just an incredible, incredible place. And that's where, um, our birds, our shared birds, are spending their, their winter time. So Tropical Wings is all about supporting the sister park arrangement then. And so, like I said, it started with this grassroots group of citizens. Um, back when, when Chris was first just floating this idea of trying to form the sister park, and it's evolved over time to, as you mentioned, this non-for-profit incorporated organization, uh, but still we're all about doing things to help those birds and supporting the sister park relationship. Oh, um, I mean, there are several aspects, facets to this, and I'm, I'm wondering how you and other volunteers got, got drawn into this. Were you already, uh, did you already have a relationship with Costa Rican parks, for instance? Or? That's a great question. Um, and as my recollection is that I was invited to a meeting that Judy 
Freund was holding in her home. Uh, one of the cool things about the Sister Park relationship is there's so many partners. So many partners were brought into making this relationship happen. And one of the partners from Costa Rica was up for a visit, and it could have even been a rotary connection. Judy Freund, again, uh -huh. should probably be joining us at the table because she's an expert in those parts of the history. Um, so there was a, a meeting uh, to just uh, share some things that were going on in Costa Rica. I was invited to that meeting as an educator um, and it really that was that was the start. That was when I first learned about the Sister Park agreement um, and this idea and I just have always had a passion for the natural world. I've always enjoyed uh, learning and watching birds. Um, so yeah, it just it started with that that meeting at Judy's house in probably 2012, 2013, I think. Well, I see. Um, so you mentioned people visiting, and and I take it some of the park rangers from Costa Rica have come here. Have some from here gone south? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Again, the sister park relationship um, has several objectives, certainly protecting the resource, um, uh, so habitat and such for the neotropical migratory bird, but they're also very much supporting um, exchanges between the professionals, the park rangers, um, both the Costa Ricans coming to visit us and folks from up here going down to visit um, Costa Rica. And so there have been several of those exchanges, um, I believe, three different times we've had guests from Costa Rica, the rangers from there coming to visit us and they they go around and actually do visit um, many of those 15 national parks that I mentioned, so not just here in the St. Croix um, Scenic Riverway. And then I believe we've had to two exchanges of rangers down south and then there's been some educator exchanges that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. We even brought a group of, of Hudson High School kids down to the Osso Peninsula um, to learn more about the birds and meet uh, some of our partners down there. Is there a particular time of year that you schedule these trips? Um, that's a great question. I've, I've actually been fortunate enough to be down there in both uh, the, the, our winter and in our summer. So um, July and March have been the two times I've been down. And we try now, we go down every year now as part of something called the Birdathon, where we bring 10 travelers down to Costa Rica and we meet our um, colleagues down there and we're a part of the bird celebration that they have down there. And so we always do arrange our trips now to coincide with their bird celebration, which is the first Saturday of March. And they're basically saying farewell to our birds, our birds, mm -hmm. our shared birds, mm -hmm. um, sending them on their way to come back here. So this is 2018, and you were there in late February, early March. Yeah, this, of this year. And yeah. there's another trip in February to March of 19? Yeah, we, ho we hope to do it every year. That was our second trip that we just came back uh, from here this winter, and we do plan on doing it every year. Um, this year, the trip will start out with visiting um, in time for their bird celebration. In the past, it had been kind of the culminating event to go to their bird celebration. So yeah, we'll be going in 2019, and um, people can go to our website if they're interested in learning more about it and getting signed up on the list to potentially join us. You think there might be space yet? Well, uh, it's very popular. Yes. We've, uh, pretty surprising being that we've only done it formally as a birdathon twice, um, but you just never know how people's plans can change, so there's always an opportunity, I would say. What is your website address? www.tropicalwings.org www.tropicalwings.org. Yep. Okay. Well, that's that's got to be be good and fun. And if people are interested, they should uh, should get right on it. Apparently, before it fills up. Um, how else can people become involved with Tropical Wings probably besides a, the trip? A, a, yeah, probably a, probably a little bit easier way. Mm -hmm. Don't have to anything for airfare would be to attend one of our two um, annual events that we hold up here. Um, I mentioned that in March they have a festival down in Costa Rica 
bidding our birds farewell. Uh, yeah, they're bidding them farewell because they're heading up to us. And then we mm -hmm. welcome them with open arms on May 11th here at the Phipps Center for the Arts. We have an evening program to kick off a weekend of uh, the St. Croix Valley Bird Migration Celebration is what we call it. So we are really excited about this year's event. Um, so again, it's at the Phipps Friday evening starting at 6.30 with a reception. And we've got um, the 2018 Year of the Bird Youth Art Exhibit. Oh, no, there's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a so, mouthful. So 2018, 2018 year is the, the year bird, of the bird. Which is a whole other discussion we should have. It is. Uh, okay, I'll make a note. Come back to YOB, year of the bird, 2018. And then w the activity at the Phipps, the, the children are involved in what way? Yeah, and so this is really another exciting component. Again, we're all about building partnerships mm -hmm. and we're all about connecting Costa Rica and the upper Midwest here um, in education and habitat conservation for the benefit of the birds. And so this youth art exhibit is involving art from students in both up in our area and down in Costa Rica. So when we were in Costa Rica, um, like I mentioned, just in February and March of this year, we displayed some artwork that students up here did. Actually, students from Lake Country Montessori in Minneapolis. Oh. They sent down artwork to Costa Rica. We displayed it. And then Costa Rican children created art that we also displayed, and then they allowed us to take it up here. So we'll have on display artwork from children down on the Osa Peninsula, as well as children not only from Lake Country School, but students from Rivercrest are creating art right here in Hudson, Rivercrest Elementary. Mm -hmm. Students up in the uh, Unity School District in Balsam Lake are creating art. And so we really wanted to get art from you know a variety of places. And so that'll all be professionally displayed. It's gonna look really cool. And of course the students will, will be there, but we're very excited to share that with the public. It'll actually be up for a full month. So it'll be up uh, until about the middle of of June, folks can come and, and look at the art from the on students. On display in the gallery at the Phipps, did you say? Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it'll be on display um, uh, in the little atrium as you walk in. Oh, yeah. And then just as you come in, um, really, as you come up the stairs, we'll have um, it displayed on those walls there, too. Do you have an artist involved? Uh, I assume yeah, Anastasia we have several. Shorten of the Phipps Absolutely. is with this. Anastasia's right. been very helpful. Oh. We have, of course, the art teachers at those schools that I mentioned are um, mm. a, a, very much on board, of course, being that they're making it happen. And then one of our um, travelers on the trip that we just took is an artist, Nancy Olson, and she's the one that's really coordinating the entire thing, and she's the one that, that connected with Lake Country Montessori in Minneapolis. Um, so she is, she is the artist behind um, the, the whole project, really. She's been working on it for, for several months, so we're very thankful, as is the case with a, an organization like ours, it's all run on volunteers, so she's putting in a lot of time to, to make it happen. The Birdathon has more than um, just kids drawing art in uh, Costa Rica, doesn't it? What are some of the other things that happen? So when Costa we went Rica? on, yeah, when we went on the trip. Uh, when uh, I think I remember something about a parade. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, their bird celebration down there is 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 really amazing, and it's a small community. Um, the Osa Peninsula is is rather remote. And the activities around the bird festival down there take place in a very small community um, right on the Gulf of Dulce, right on the ocean. And one of the things that's really fun about participating in that is that it seems like everyone from the community is a part of the event. The children um, that, that come to be a part of the event um, wear costumes so they look like birds. Beautiful, oh, yeah. feathered. Uh, wings and a tail and a mask and just just gorgeous and both of the neotropical birds but they of course are going to wear some um, costumes of their resident birds because 
they're just enamored with the scarlet macaws and the toucans uh. and, and such. So they, they, there's a little bit of a mix of both the migratory birds and the resident birds. And so yes, so they're in a parade. And a, the parade down there is, is also a unique experience for me in that you don't stand in one place and watch a parade go by. You actually mm -hmm. walk along with the parade. So mm -hmm. again, just many, many community members are just walking along with this parade with the kids. and. Uh, it, it's a pretty fun experience. Um, and then they, the parade basically takes them to the location for the celebration for the rest of the day. And there's um, traditional dancers and, and speakers and just different displays and things. Bird watching certainly with the kids. Um, it's all really about educating people about um, the birds and about the importance of habitat conservation. So you've been there several times now and you've mm -hmm. had occasion and you're a lifelong educator yourself. Mm -hmm. What, what, w if anything, have you formed impressions about um, the level of education, the level of understanding of bird life, the importance of habitat, the details and spe specifics, as shown by the Costa Rican children that you've seen? Do, the, do you get the idea that their their art, their um, uh, costumes and so on reflect a level of understanding that is, let's say, comparable to the level of understanding of our children mm -hmm. at, at the same age? Yeah, well, there's been a lot of effort put into the education down there. And so those children uh, that we're working with um, that are in the festival and such, they are building a really strong foundation of um, understanding more about the birds. Um, I would say that they weren't necessarily exposed to it um, as much before they got involved into mm -hmm. um, the, the program, but there's a, uh, one of our partners down there, um, an organization called OSA Birds, um, has been working very hard to bring the messages and the education about the birds and the importance of the birds uh, and uh, conservation and just the, the kind of the attitude of respect for the environment and respect for all living things. And so their efforts have really, really paid off um, both directly in the school year round as well as um, these events culminating in the bird festival. So um, it's a, it's been a great opportunity for these kids. Do you, does, does the organization OSA Birds and this education in the Costa Rican schools, the growth of it or the, the apparent uh, recent success of it, are those byproducts of this sister park relationship and the interchange between rangers of the 15 American parks and the four or five Costa Rican Parks, do you also, think? Also, Birds has really, their role has really been the, uh, um, you know, education, working with this bird um, festival, and then, of course, they're, they work on research and such and, and, and doing think? studies and things to, to, to work on the birds. They aren't directly, um, you know, like they didn't sign to be a part mm -hmm. of the Sister Park mm -hmm. Agreement, but they've proved just invaluable in the support that they're giving to the, to the festival. They're really helping the park service down there, which is called CNAC. Um, they're a, a partner with CNAC, would probably be the best way to say it. And so um, their work has really made the bird uh, festival possible. Kind of like volunteers up here and organizations up here might, might help our park service mm -hmm. um, make mm -hmm. things happen, almost like a friends group of the parks down there. Ah, mm -hmm. Now the, St. Croix National Scenic uh, Riverway has, already has a friends group, the St. Croix River Association. Absolutely. So Tropical Wings is like a friends group, but it's not uh, exactly, it doesn't displace the St. Croix River Association. Oh, not at all. It's no, in no. a different sphere, I take it? Yeah, they're another partner, of course, that's making um, conservation uh, of the riverway uh, a huge priority and, 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 and just, um, yeah, they do amazing work, amazing work, which is allowing our birds to have a place to live when they come up here, much mm -hmm. of their efforts. And so they're a friends group, as you said, of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. We look at ourselves, in fact, it's um, 
there's talk that it'll become official that we're a friends group of the sister park relationship. Wow. And so that's what we're really here to support. And so the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway is our home base for Tropical Wings, but we are, again, supporting this relationship that involves 15 national parks um, in the upper Midwest. And in fact, we'll be going to Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, which is one of the 15 partners up here, one of the 15 sister parks uh, of the upper Midwest. And we'll be going to their bird festival and meeting with the liaison for Tropical Wings and the sister park relationship in that uh, Paul Labovitz, who's a superintendent over there. And so it's, it's, it's much bigger than just the St. Croix Valley, but certainly this is where uh, really all the board members live in at least close to the St. Croix Valley. And so we're focusing like the bird migration celebration here. I notice uh, your, your flyer for the event, the, the FIPS event is just one of the things that's yeah. going on during this uh, two day period here. Uh, and some of them are in Minnesota and some of them are in Wisconsin. Uh, and so I take it that's where your board members are located is Minnesota and Wisconsin. Absolutely, right, oh. right. Mm -hmm. And the St. Croix Flyway Bird Migration Celebration, which kicks off Friday night, as we mentioned at the FIPS, um, we have quite a few different events uh, up and down the riverway on Saturday morning, and we actually even have a Mother's Day hike at Bellwind Conservancy mm. Sunday morning, early enough that you can still get to church or brunch or whatever else you need to do that ah. day. Uh-huh, uh-huh, good. Um, well, uh, the, the uh, people are bound to wonder what what are some of the birds that ah. you call your neotropical migratory birds that could be seen in the winter in Costa Rica and in the summer up here. Yeah. Are there some species we would recognize the names of and so on? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what, one of the exciting things of this birdathon where we travel down to Costa Rica in the winter is that we see them down there and we just all go kinds of just we go crazy when we see them we get all excited and just jump up and down uh, the baltimore oriole is probably mm -hmm. uh, the one that is most familiar to people uh, in fact folks are often putting out um, their grape jelly or their orange slices to attract them to their yard i actually um, have heard that they are they are back and so certainly there's something to start looking for so the baltimore mm -hmm. oriole is a uh, one of our uh, more famous mm -hmm. species. Another one, of course, here living along the river um, that will also migrate to Costa Rica is the osprey. Mm. And a lot of people think of these neotropical migrants as little warblers, and there's many little warblers, um, but the osprey is one too, as is uh, another raptor, the northern harrier, uh -huh. which is a hawk, basically, yeah. that can be seen in prairies and, and marshes. Um, I believe that's back now too. I've heard people talking about the the northern really? harrier. Yep, which Already. is pretty exciting. Uh -huh. um, there's warblers are are really fascinating to watch, and the, and they're little colorful birds, um, many different color patterns and things, and they're not always easy to see because they flit around a lot and they tend to show up just as the leaves are starting to come out because they're looking for the insects, which are going to be found on those leaves. And so a few of the warblers though to, to look for that are coming uh, some potentially from the Osa Peninsula are the black and white warbler that's striped kind of like a zebra. Um, that's one we saw when we were down in Costa Rica. The yellow warbler, which as its name implies is yellow all over, uh, but not to be confused with the goldfinch, which of course is yellow with a black mm -hmm. cap. Uh, the Wilson's warbler actually looks a little like a goldfinch because it's yellow with the black cap. Um, bird watching can be a little confusing, yeah. <laughs> but it's still fun. And then the other warbler I wanted to mention is the chestnut-sided warbler. It has these beautiful stripes of a, a br chestnutty brown on the sides uh, of, of the bird's body. That is just delightful to see. So there's there's many others, but those are some of the, the key ones. I know even a, a hike out at Willow River State Park would, would show you these birds down along Lakefront um, Park. You're gonna see see these birds flitting around in the trees uh, right about now. So 
When you see them in February and March in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. they have essentially the s very same plumage they have when they arrive in Hudson in the spring, right? Yeah, by then, by then they are, right, exactly, okay. exactly. Um, in the fall, they wouldn't, so our fall, they wouldn't have the same colors, but yep, they're all, mm -hmm. all looking pretty, ready to come up and start uh, finding their territories the and, and building the nests, yep. Yeah. Do they sing the same songs, do you think? Well, they don't uh, sing breeding songs. Yeah, down, down, in, there. down in Costa Rica, no, uh, not necessarily, although some, I mean, you'll hear the Oriole and such, yeah. but they do much more singing up here because, of course, one of, one of the reasons for the singing is to defend a territory or to attract a mate, so it's going to happen mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot more up here. Uh, are some of these uh, species in decline in their numbers? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Most, uh, all, um, just some? Some, yeah, yeah. and it's uh, the golden-winged warbler is one that's a species of concern mm -hmm. um, that is in decline, and that's actually um, our, our logo has a golden-winged warbler. We kind of look at that as, as, our, as our mascot, mm -hmm. um, and we did see one down there, which I was oh. very excited about, but they're not going to be as common up here. I mean, since you brought up this whole idea of bird species in decline, it would be an excellent time to mention about why 2018 is the year of the bird. Well, take it away. All right. <laughs> so Draw a line through that topic. <laughs> year of the bird. Oh. Patty Mueller. Patty Mueller, year of the bird. So 2018, year of the bird. Um, uh, 2018 marks 100 years since the passage of legislation known as the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So in 1918, mm -hmm. um, this act was passed. And it was passed in response to um, basically the commercial exploitation of birds, birds and bird feathers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the egret would probably not be with us today if that act wasn't passed because those beautiful white tail feathers mm -hmm. um, were, were in, in demand. Um, so this for bird, really important things for like ladies' like hats. Like hats, <laughs> very important things. Right. Fashion has, has decimated different species uh, around the world, ask the beaver. Yeah. But anyway, um, so the year of the bird then is, is really building an awareness of this 100-year-old mm -hmm. Migratory Bird Treaty Act and just acknowledging the importance of that act and how many um, species it has really um, worked to, to save, um, conserve, um, protect from, from endangerment or, or extinction. Um, that act is actually under threat currently, and so if people want to learn more about that, just the political will to, to um, maintain the the act and the protection within that act and so our birds are really very much at the mercy of decisions that we make um, especially the migratory birds being that they're traveling such a long way there's so many potential things happening from where they're spending their winter to where they're spending their summer mm -hmm. uh, something as as uh, what seemingly benign as a tall glass building could be the death of a bird. And so there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot for us to, to kind of think about when we reflect on conservation for birds and just what we can do uh, in our own backyards even to help the birds. If people want to know more about that, where would they look? The Cornell Lab of Ornithology or that's the a, that's Audubon a, that's site? That's a great, yeah, or that's or a great. A link on the Tropical Wing site? Actually, um, the city of Hudson even oh. has information on their web page, but certainly Audubon, Tropical Wings, we have some links on our website. Several places that you can go to. You can even just Google how to protect our birds and oh. those links will come up. Um, there's simple things though, um, when we talked about glass and flying into to, to windows, just putting simple decals on the windows if you're uh, noticing that there's a lot of bird activity, especially if you have a bird feeder uh, right outside your window, mm -hmm. uh, can really help, help mm -hmm. the birds. And the high risk time for window strikes is migration, 
Certainly Industry migration. And migration in the fall when young birds are yep, for but the first it, But time. it can really happen all winter long if you're feeding mm -hmm. the birds. If, you, mm -hmm. if there's birds there, they could potentially fly into your window. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you touched on um, the City of Hudson yeah. website, and I think you have some some new news regarding the City of Hudson and birds. Absolutely. Tell us about that. Yes, I'm really excited to... Uh, to report that the city of Hudson applied for and has been awarded um, bird city status, mm -hmm. um, which is a program that the state of Wisconsin has. Actually, the Audubon um, Society out of Milwaukee who is who sponsors this, and we're the 109th city in Wisconsin to be designated a bird city. So we're very, very excited about that. <clears throat> what is that? Uh I know you did a lengthy application and then the city had to cooperate with them. some stuff or a resolution mm -hmm. or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Website changes and yeah. and uh, there are going to be two signs, right? I believe so. <laughs> I, everyone, will, everyone will know that we're a bird city. But up along the highway yeah. somewhere. But it's, it really um, was just a matter of showcasing some of the very cool things Hudson as a city has already done. I mean, just that Hudson is a tree city was something that was put on the application for being a bird city. It just shows that Hudson cares about conservation and um, having open spaces. Uh, we're, um, we have a project that's coming up that I know, Buck, you helped make happen where we're going to be doing some buckthorn control in one of our parks up in Prospect Park. And we're doing it with goats, which is exciting. And so just th that was even a part of our application. Oh, tell us more. What do you mean? How are we using goats? Yeah, so. and so um, goats eat things. They like to eat... Um, tin cans out of parks? I, I, I hope that there's not any tin cans up there. but. Um, goats will browse the buckthorn, and my understanding is that the goats will come in for, um, boy, maybe a month or so at a time? Is that about right? I think so. Twice and and they'll scenario. come in at least twice, right. And so the, they browse and browse and browse and browse and browse and browse and browse on the, the buckthorn, which basically is a woody shrub, and that browsing is going to be kicking back or scaling back the prevalence then of the buckthorn, and they come back a second time to just finish the deed, and uh, I think it's just going to be really exciting. It'll be a great way to raise people's awareness of the importance of healthy habitat and how buckthorn is, is not something that, that is what we want in our parks or in our backyards, for that matter. I saw you at the County Earth Day celebration just a couple weekends ago, I guess, and uh, you had a, you had a uh, show piece there for Tropical Wings, and across the circle from you were some of the goat yeah. people, right? Yeah. The, the like, Munch Bunch. Exactly, the Sunshine Munch Bunch. Falls. Yep, and they brought baby goats, and who doesn't go gaga over baby goats? They were in a pen, and they actually allowed the small children in the pen and just closed the pen behind them, and so they were children and goats having a grand old time. So yeah. it's very exciting. We're really excited with the idea of goats helping with habitat restoration, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that is good. Um, so I gathered, circling back to Tropical Wings, uh, it's a nonprofit. If people want to make donations, they can do it through the website, I gather. Absolutely, and they can become a member um, at a variety of different levels. Mm -hmm. And all those funds then are used for habitat restoration and education. In fact, something that, that I've neglected to mention, which is a cornerstone of, of our work, is that each year we distribute money through habitat grants. And again, we're all about partnerships. So there's a variety of organizations, any organization really, within the St. Croix watershed, which is a 5,000 square mile piece of real estate, as you know, um, can apply for these grants. And so this year, we awarded five grants. And I'll see if I can remember. We awarded to the Standing Cedars Land Conservancy to the Friends of Freedom Park um, at the Great River Road Learning 
um, Center. Center. I yeah, Prescott, don't know if I'm saying right. yeah, Prescott. Thank you. They have a long yeah. name. Uh, Rivercrest Elementary School. We're very excited that they applied. Mm. They what have they done doing? well. They've done a lot of work with um, habitat restoration. Mm -hmm. They have taken out buckthorn. They have restored a native prairie. Um, they have an outdoor classroom. They have a bluebird trail, and so um, they requested funds to further their work with their prairie restoration and incorporate even more educational um, opportunities for the students uh, in that restoration process, which we're really excited about. I remember when your husband John was a teacher of fifth graders there and we started a rain garden near the entrance yes, road. Yes, absolutely. Catch the water running off one of those uh, practice fields. Yeah, so they've, been, they've got a lot of great things. They've done controlled things. burns on the yep, prairie yep, up there. Absolutely. A tree track around the outside of it, uh, yeah, that was started there. Yeah, the, the, a great the school. Rivercrest School is just doing a lot of um, um, cutting edge things with their kids with, with habitat conservation, restoration, education. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we're real excited to partner with them. We actually were just there. Uh, doing something with their environmental kids club. My husband John and I went and did a presentation on the migratory birds and went out and did some mm. bird watching with the kids and uh, just thank them for all, thank the kids for all that they are doing in furthering habitat for the neotropical migratory birds. So. Ah. And I know another of your grants this year uh, is going to the establishment of a monitoring well yes. to help in our understanding little east of here in Erin Prairie uh, Township of St. Croix County, the re understanding that relationship between the precipitation that falls and what shows up in the groundwater. There's some understanding of recharge areas and the bounce effect and things like that. Since I was involved in that, I'm very Absolutely. interested and grateful yeah. for the grant. Absolutely, and to clarify that, that grant actually was again a part of a partnership. So that mm -hmm. grant actually came from the St. Croix Master Watershed Stewards Program, mm -hmm. um, which is something, again, Tropical Wings partnered with. And so um, that we were able to award four different grants as a part of that partnership. Uh, One-time grants, we won't be doing those each year like we will with the Habitat grants. But yeah, we've been very fortunate to uh, support some just excellent uh, habitat restoration and educational work within the watershed, both through the Master Watershed Stewards Program as well as through Tropical Wing, so. The year before, I remember there was one to the Prairie Enthusiasts. That had yeah, and Crex Meadows, some, yeah. Crex. They both, those were the two both grantees. Both were habitat yep. uh, Absolutely. things. Like and both that. really looking at more prairie ecosystems. Um, mm -hmm. So that uh, um, definitely an endangered ecosystem, mm -hmm. the prairie. As we all know, there used to be a lot more of it than there is today. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's less than a tenth of a percent of Wisconsin's original prairie. And this this particular area that we reside in was uh, was was prairie more mm -hmm. than it was forest, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, one of your board members is on the staff over at Bellwyn, isn't she? The Bellwyn Conservancy, uh, Lynette Anderson? Yes, yeah. absolutely, and they have- They do the buffalo, <coughs> you know, yeah. as a part of their management of their prairie. Yeah, I believe the right? buffalo are coming May 19th. They have quite a big oh. uh, event planned for that. So if anyone wants to see buffalo arrive on the restored prairies over at Bowen, that, that would be another great day out with the family. Um, and they do a lot of bird conservation work too. In fact, they were recipients of one of our very first habitat grants several oh. years ago um, with work that they were doing. And I believe, again, it was uh, focused on some prairie restoration efforts that they were having over there. So. Lots of great partners. Uh, there's really no lack of places to visit uh, in the area that are doing work um, to celebrate really the natural world and uh, all the critters that we're sharing the space with. Seems to me there are like 54, 55 species of neotropical migrant birds that, that do their breeding more or less from Hudson on north and they're wintering in Costa Rica, and of that number from of, Wisconsin, exactly. From that Wisconsin. are that are mm -hmm. that are um, yeah Wisconsin migrants, exactly. And I think six of them are prairie or ground nesting uh, birds. You mentioned the harrier and other uh, others. 
in that category. Yeah. Seems strange to think of them traveling so far to find a piece of ground to nest on. It's amazing, <coughs> yeah, and people wonder that too, but um, they need a lot of resources to raise a brood, and they may be raising several several mm -hmm. um, broods of, of uh, babies each year, each summer, and there's enough food down there for the winter to just feed themselves, but if they were gonna try and set up housekeeping down there and, and raise mm -hmm. the kids, um, the thought is, at least, the biologists think that there just isn't enough resources mm -hmm. to, to raise um, the young. They need a tremendous amount of insects. It's incredible, uh, and they only eat insects, even if they're generally a, a seed-eating bird as an adult. When, they're, when it's a nestling, it's, it's totally raised on the insects. So need a lot of them. Yeah, that's good. Anything else you want to say about tropical wings that we didn't cover other than a, a pitch for more members and then I'll make a, a repeat of yeah, the FIPS event? Yeah, definitely. Um, no, just uh, for people to, to know that we're all about habitat conservation and education for the neotropical migratory birds and we support this National Park Service sister park uh, mm -hmm. relationship. And we have a national park in our own backyard, which I want to make sure everyone knows because that's often um, people don't realize that. And that's that's the 50th year of that, isn't it? Absolutely, right? yes. Everybody that is encouraged to use this logo of the Park Service's 50th anniversary of the first designation of one of the original wild and scenic rivers, the upper. St. Croix yes. and Namakagan. Thank you for saying that. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about that celebration. 50 years of the National Wild and Scenic River Act is is something to be celebrated. Well, if I remember right, the, the space in the black box theater at the Phipps is limited to under 200 people or something. We're going like to be that. in the river room this year, actually. Oh, we're going to be in the river room. Yeah. Okay. But still, yeah. It's still it's, it's limited. A smaller so people space. better arrive early. There'll, there'll be room. Just come. They will. Just come. Six thirty on Friday, May eleventh. Celebrate two thousand eighteen, the year of the bird, a live peregrine falcon. View the youth art exhibition, and the program. Uh, storyteller Al Bat. Mm -hmm. Presentation of the Bird City, Wisconsin plaques or things. And that'll happen at 7.30, so the program starts at 7.30. 7.30. And an original song by students from Rivercrest Elementary. Speaking of Rivercrest, they do a lot of things over there. Including writing songs, at least while your husband was a if, teacher uh, there. Yep, they, and he'll be playing the guitar and yep, leading yep, the kids in the song. Yep, and he's got some Rivercrest students that'll be joining, about 20-some kids. So we're looking forward to hearing the song again this year. That's grand. Thank you for answering my questions and telling the story of Tropical Wings, Patty. Absolutely. Thank you very much for, for having us here today. And this is Western Wisconsin Journal.